Hello, everyone, and welcome to the annual JCRF Station Program. My name is Chris Watts, and I serve as Secretary of Chief of the Office of the Chairman of Civil Rights. I'm here with Claire Welch, who serves as the Proposal Manager. We are so pleased you could join us in this important conversation with the Mark County Chief of the Board. Today, we have brought together an impressive array of scholars and practitioners to discuss the impact of the city policy. What that abolition no further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chris. Before we begin with an opening message from Sister Helen Frazier, I would like to extend a couple thank yous. Thank you, first, Professor Peppers, Professor Shapiro, and Professor Klein for their guidance. I would also like to thank the symposium committee, Sydney Clark, Jim Susan, Kaylin Marcheski, and Hope Barnes. Additionally, Susan Rosales and Peyton Hollihan for their work on the graphic. I would also like to extend a thank you to Skylar Patel and William Truman for their technical assistance, and a huge thank you to Wendy Rains and Dean Mason for their support and direction throughout the planning process. Lastly, I would like to thank all of our participants, panelists, and moderators for being so flexible and supportive. The passion each and every one of you has shown through your work is inspiring. To begin, we will have Sister Helen Frazier share a few words. Sister Frazier is known around the world for her tireless work against the death penalty. She has been instrumental in sparking national dialogue on capital punishment and in shaping the Catholic Church's vigorous opposition to all executions. She is known for her best selling book, Dead Man Walking, based on her experiences with two death row inmates for whom she served as a spiritual advisor before their execution. She served as the national chairperson of the National Coalition to abolish the death penalty from 1993 to 1995. She helped establish the moratorium campaign, seeking to end executions and conducting education on the death penalty. Sister Frazier also founded the group Survive to help families of victims of murder and related crimes. She runs her organization, Ministry of the Death Penalty from New Orleans. Sister Helen has won numerous awards and honors for her work and was not nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Here's a pre-recorded message, message from Sister Helen. She unfortunately couldn't join us live, but she wanted to share her wise words.
It's all you, Helen. Hi, everybody. How wonderful that the law students have assembled this group together to dig into the issue of the death penalty and how we need to shut down the machinery of death and what we can learn from Virginia. I mean, yeah, Virginia, the first ex-Confederate state that killed more people, had slaves the longest, the whole thing of the Virginia history, and they did it. And we want to learn from each other. I've been working on this 30 years, and I found out some things about the American public and the death penalty. A lot of people in the first, it's a non-reflective mode. It's a surface soul thing. They just go, there are some people that do these terrible crimes. They are outraged as what has happened to innocent victims. And they just say, it just seems like justice. They kill, they die. And it's kind of based on an assumption, too, that we have a a good court system. We may make some mistakes sometimes, but basically the American system of justice is fair. And so, especially with all the appeals, and this is most people coming into the death penalty. And then when the death penalty was put in place, people were made to be so afraid of these murderers, so evil in their character or by the nature of what they had done, that we couldn't even trust putting them in prison that they'd kill guards or they'd kill other inmates. These people are evil. And so when you absolutize evil and demonize a person and the people were made to be afraid of them, this is what we have to do. They're crime, they deserve it. And this is what we have to do for safety. And they kind of bought into that. And people kind of that, that support the death penalty, you talk to them, first blush, they say, yeah, I support it and here's why. But then you get in there with him and you educate them. And that is, of course, what happened in Virginia big time. And so we know that there were a number of forces operative in Virginia. And we got to have every one of these forces at work in, to abolish the death penalty and wherever we are. First of all, those good, faithful people like in the Virginia uh, Coalition for Alternatives to the Death Penalty, plodding along, tilling the soil doing the education, waking up the people, getting plowed over time and time again with executions, keep going, keep getting to the people. And the Virginia coalition was there. Then you had individuals like Marie Deans in there with innocent people like Joe Jared Tanner, Earl Washington, believing in the innocence of people, seeing how broken this system was and getting in there with them and working with them and working with them and working with them. And their cases figured in when Ralph Northam, the governor, gave the Commonwealth Address. He mentioned that we almost in Virginia had killed innocent people. So getting the stories out of people, the innocent people, the wrongfully convicted people, are who really highlight how broken the system is. We're now at what, 186, maybe 187 wrongfully convicted people who've had the luck enough to get off a of death row, to be exonerated. For every eight people of the 1,500 people plus that we have executed, one in every eight has had to be freed because we made a mistake, one in eight. Can you picture, can you picture buying an airplane ticket and they have a little red alert at the top of your ticket? You got, just to let you know that you got a one in eight chances of, that your planes are gonna go down in flames. That's how broken it is. People don't know how broken it is. And you got to bring them there. And you got to work with individual lives. One of the things that happened in Virginia is they got money to have good defense lawyers. And once they did that, it was a precipitous decline in the practice of the death penalty. And then you always have to allow for individuals 
that can change and then stand up and be witnesses. That's present in the governor's story, New York Times, just a whole story about him and the change that happened in him, doing a black face in college, and saying he was only like doing a moonwalk like Michael Jackson and trying to get out of it. And then when he realized that going to cities and meeting with black leaders all across Virginia, and they let him have it, and he took it, and he changed. And so you can always have the individual leaders in a state that can change. So we always work with hope. We work with hope with the people that they can change. Then you had really good strategy going on in Virginia. And you had cold knocking on doors, you know, getting out to the people. Hey, where do you stand on the death penalty? Not assuming that people are for the death penalty and you're not ever going to get it anywhere with people. So education of the people is central. Clear strategies to get good defense so that, so that I mean, and, and people, like you're going to hear from Steve Bright, you're going to hear from David Brook, who well know that if you got a really good defense and you don't even let it get to trial, you're not going to have the death penalty. The two fault lines that I'm very clear now have happened from the, with the death penalty from the very beginning was when the Supreme Court put it back on the Gregg decision in 76. Two big fault lines. One, an impossible criteria to determine who should die. They said only the worst to the worst. Not your ordinary murders in the United States, whatever that means. Not your garden variety, whatever that means. Only the worst of the worst. And they couple that with complete discretionary power of prosecutors to go for death or not. The truth is, if you do not have a prosecutor that seeks death from square one at trial, nobody dies. And so what's being exposed about the death penalty, and we saw this with the Trump bar executions, 13 of them, after a 17 year hiatus at the federal level, here 13 people were killed. Lisa Montgomery, her date was moved back to January. And when they told her the date in January, she kind of wistfully looked away and just said eight days, eight days before Biden would be president, she'd be allowed to live. Look at the vagaries where you leave it in the hands, the discretionary power over life and death in the hands of political people, human beings, frail people, ignorant people, prejudiced people who make these decisions that people live or die. All of these things are going in our favor now, plus what happened in Virginia, the waking up George Floyd's death, Black Lives Matter, Confederate statues coming down. And a lot of people, before they think about the death penalty, are not aware of how race of the victim plays the key role. Did you kill a white person or not? And that when Black people are killed in this country, 50% of all homicides, it's not a blip on the screen. The American public, we as a nation, are beginning now in a new way. we got a long way to go. But we're beginning to wake up to racism that's in all of the systems and is a direct legacy of slavery. So thank you, Virginia. You lit the beam at the top of the hill, and we're going to follow it. And all of you assembled together. If you want to know where the force is in this nation, the moral force that's going to end the death penalty, it's all of you assembled together. You're going to get the knowledge you need. You're going to have the fire stirred in your heart of the passion you need, and you're connected in a community of people that can help sustain you in your efforts so that we do not stop until we help bend the arc of the universe and we shut down state killing forever in this nation. So glad to have a minute just to talk to you. Wish you well. Think creatively. Think boldly. Stay connected in community. Learn a lot and go do good work. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for those powerful words. And thank you, everyone else, for bearing with us through our technical difficulties. Our first panel of the day is titled The Worst of the Worst Cases. Moderating the panel is Christina, Christina Torrance, and our panelists are Mark Bookman, Jonathan Shapiro, Stephen Northup, and Gerald Serkin.
Mark Bookman is the executive director of the Atlantic Center for Capital Representation, a nonprofit resource center founded in 2010 and dedicated to all aspects of death penalty defense. He was in the homicide unit of the Defender Association of Philadelphia from its inception in 1993 until 2010. He has published essays in The Atlantic, Mother Jones, Slate, and other magazines on various aspects of death penalty jurisprudence and a compilation of those essays entitled A Descending Spiral, Exposing the Death Penalty in 12 Essays, was published by the New Press in May 2021. Jonathan Shapiro has practiced criminal law in the federal and state courts for the past 45 years. He has been listed for years in Washingtonian Magazine's survey of best criminal lawyers. Among his clients were accused CIA spy Harold Nicholson and accused NSA spy Ryan Reagan. Along with his partner, Peter Greenspun, he represented Beltway sniper John Allen Muhammad. He received the 2001 Peter Sestino Alumni Award for outstanding advocacy in the public interest within the United States from the American University of Washington College of Law and the 2018 Elliott Milstein Award for Professional Excellence, also from the Washington College of Law. I've been informed you can't hear me very well. Hopefully this helps. Mr. Shapiro was previously a clinical instructor at the Washington College of Law, where he was also the director of the Institutionalized Persons Clinic. He teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, evidence, and the criminal practice path. Gerald Zirkin graduated from Brandeis University and received his JD from Boston College Law School in 1976. He's practiced in Virginia since then, concentrating on habeas corpus, criminal defense, and civil rights litigation. He represented 15 Virginia death row inmates in habeas corpus proceedings, and in 1996, he began defending federal capital cases. He served as senior litigator for the Federal Defender Office for the Eastern District of Virginia, beginning in 2001, responsible for the defense of all the Federal Defender Office's capital cases, and then as Federal Capital Resource Counsel, assisting and advising federal capital defense teams in the Eastern U.S until his retirement in 2015. He returned to private practice focusing on federal criminal defense, including capital cases. He represented Zechariah Musai, the only 9-11 defendant prosecuted in civilian court, and Daryl Rice, the wrongly accused defendant in the Shenandoah National Park double homicide. And he was, was also counsel for two Virginia death row exonerations. He has defended federal capital cases in Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, New York, and Louisiana. He is a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers. Stephen Northup is a retired partner with the law firm Troutman Pepper. His career was focused on complex commercial litigation, with many of his cases set in federal courts throughout the country. Earlier in his career, he took on pro bono post-conviction cases on behalf of two inmates on Virginia's death row. In the early 2000s, he accepted an appointment to represent an inmate from Virginia on federal death row in a post-conviction challenge to his conviction and death sentence. Currently, he still represents this client. Mr. Northup's pro bono work has included a number of wrongful conviction cases, among them such high profile cases as the Norfolk Four. He has continued to do pro bono work during his retirement, exclusively representing prisoners or former prisoners seeking relief from wrongful convictions or release on parole. And lastly, moderating our panel is Hushane Corn. She is the executive director of the Innocence Project. She previously served as the president and an attorney in charge of the Office of the Appellate Defender, one of New York's oldest institutional providers of indigent appellate defense representation. Christina argued and won Buck v. Davis, a challenge to the introduction of explicitly racially biased evidence in the Texas death penalty case in the United Supreme Court. Christina is one of few Black women to have argued before the Supreme Court and was the only Black woman to argue in the 2016 Supreme Court term. 
Christina earned a JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School and a BA from Howard University. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Horn. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I want to thank Washington and Lee for inviting us to have this important conversation. It's really an honor to be here, um, especially now in Virginia after, you know, as Helen pointed out, the state has really taken the lead um, in this country on doing the right thing and abolishing the death penalty. Um, it's an honor to be here with Mark, yeah. and Jerry and Steve, uh, who have extraordinary, an extraordinary uh, breadth of experience in the front lines of representing people who are condemned to death in this country. Um, I think we're gonna learn a lot from hearing about their experiences uh, doing this work. You know, we have been promised for the last almost 50 years in this country that the United States Supreme Court has sort of refined and whittled and uh, tried to craft death penalty statutes that will deliver us as a country uh, what they have called the worst of the worst offenders. The court has endeavored to find ways to make sure that we are not going to impose the death penalty on people who are particularly vulnerable, people who are not particular, who are not culpable, um, and really only limit the application of the death penalty to the most extreme murderers. I think the experiences that we're gonna hear from uh, our three presenters may raise uh, real questions about the success of the court's last 46, almost 50 years of working to accomplish this goal. And so with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to them and then uh, I think they're each gonna talk for about mm, 10 minutes apiece about cases that they have worked on. And then we will sort of engage in a, in a conversation. Um, about about the work. So I'm going to start with you, Jerry, just because you're first on my screen and, and big in the screen. <laughs> we're going to actually do it alphabetically, so I'm going to be last. Yeah. Well, last we, 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 Nobody tells the moderator anything. No one tells the moderator anything. Yeah. So we're we, going alphabetically. <laughs> we were holding it as a surprise. I appreciate it. <laughs> alphabetically, <laughs> alphabetically by first name or last name? I, I, I don't know. Because last no name. It's, it, it's, it's, it's me first. So <laughs> Jerry is right. By, by dint of alphabet and last name, I'm going to go first here. And, uh, and, and then it will be uh, uh, Steve, uh, John, and Jerry will be last. So uh, I, I join in, in uh, thanking Washington and Lee for doing this, uh, putting together a, a fantastic symposium. Uh, we talked earlier, uh, uh, the panel talked earlier about what cases we would discuss and we each had dozens of cases that we could have talked about. I decided to talk about a case that, uh, that a Supreme Court justice actually labeled uh, 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 the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. So it seemed, it seemed appropriate to, to do that in this case. So I'm gonna talk about the Henry Lee McCollum case in North Carolina, a case that, I, that I've written about, but I, I had no direct relation to. Um, the, so, so the case was, is about 40 years old at this point. Uh, and certainly the crime was a, a, a brutal, awful crime. So the, the, the rape strangulation of an 11 year old girl named Sabrina Bowie in a tiny little town in North Carolina called Red Springs. And um, Henry Lee McCollum uh, quickly became a suspect, but by all accounts, he was uh, uh, intellectually disabled. Um, but this was, this was two decades before Atkins versus Virginia would have excluded him from, from the death penalty. And so uh, he actually became a suspect most likely because he was intellectually disabled. Uh, a, a young girl in the town said that he acted weirdly and this brought the attention of Mr. McCollum to the, to the law enforcement community. They uh, uh, interrogated him for, for hours and hours and hours and finally extracted a confession from him and his stepbrother, Leon Brown. Uh, the confessions were not uh, particularly consistent, but uh, the law enforcement didn't worry too much about that. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a terrible crime. Well, at the time, North Carolina mandated uh, a capital prosecution for any first degree murder case. Uh, one of the very, very few states to do that. And so it didn't really matter 
who the prosecutor was uh, since it had to be a capital prosecution under the law. But as it just so happened, the prosecutor was a man named Joe Freeman Britt, uh, a legendary death penalty prosecutor, uh, uh, labeled the deadliest prosecutor in the United States by, of all things, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records in the, in the late 70s. Um, in any case, uh, Joe Freeman Britt prosecuted the case, put Mr. McCollum on death row twice. Mr. McCollum got a, got a, a, a resentencing uh, and, then, and then another death sentence. And he was on death row um, in 1994. Uh, uh, his case was had finally gotten to the United States Supreme Court. And in 1994, Justice Blackman uh, uh, said probably the most famous thing he had said in his lifetime, which was uh, uh, something that, that, that Sister Helen had just, had just quoted, if I, if I heard her correctly. Uh, uh, Justice Blackman, in the case of Callens versus Collins, uh, went through the extraordinary efforts of the Supreme Court to try to make capital punishment constitutional. In his opinion, they had failed. And he said, quote, from this day forward, I no longer shall tinker with the machinery of death. Uh, a quote that almost instantly went up on progressive college dorm walls uh, as, he, as he said it. Um, but his quote was taken badly by Justice Scalia. And Justice Scalia responded by, by pointing out that in his opinion, the Cowan's case was not a particularly brutal murder and that Justice Blackman had essentially cherry picked the case uh, to make his comment. Justice, Bla Justice Scalia then went on to, to point out the McCollum case and how awful it was. And he said, quote, how enviable a quiet death by lethal injection compared to that. So Justice Scalia uh, literally pinpointed the, 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 the McCollum case as the worst of the worst. Well, time moved on and uh, uh, the McCollum case came up itself for cert. It was denied, but Justice Blackman pointed out that even in a brutal case like the McCollum case, Mr. McCollum was not the most culpable. He pointed out he was intellectually disabled. He had no significant history. His role in the crime was not any greater than the other people who had been uh, a, a arrested for the crime. So he wasn't even the most culpable in the crime itself. Nonetheless, uh, uh, time continued to move on. And in 2009, the North, Car North Carolina passed something called the Racial Justice Act, which was an act that enabled uh, the defense to point out uh, uh, racial disparities or race discrimination in, in, in the cases uh, and would enable the, the defense to litigate those issues. The Racial Justice Act did not sit well with uh, uh, some members of the, of the North Carolina legislature. One year later, they, they circulated posters with Mr. McCollum's picture on them. And the, the posters said, get to know Henry Lee McCollum. Uh, if the Racial Justice Act is not repealed, he will be, quote, moving to your neighborhood. Uh, uh, and these posters were circulated. The North Carolina legislature apparently got the message. They repealed the Racial Justice Act shortly thereafter. Nonetheless, uh, time continued to move on. And uh, DNA from the crime scene, crime scene was finally analyzed. And what it turned up was that a man named Roscoe Artis was responsible for the crime. The coincidence of Roscoe Artis uh, being responsible was not great. Uh, he had been prosecuted by the same DA, Joe Freeman Britt. He'd been represented by the same defense attorney as Mr. McCollum. So here's, here's the, 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 the similarities between the McCollum case and Roscoe Artis' case. Prosecuted by the same DA, represented by the same defense attorney, the case had occurred in the same small town of Red Springs and, and, and Artis had been sent to death row one month earlier than Mr. McCollum's trial for a very, very similar crime. And yet the, 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 the state of North Carolina claimed that they had no sense that Roscoe Artis might be a suspect in this crime. Um, Joe Freeman Britt went to his death uh, uh, claiming that 
that uh, uh, Henry Lee McCollum and his half brother were in fact guilty of this crime, but a civil jury did, uh, disagreed. They uh, uh, rewarded Mr. McCollum with uh, uh, $31 million for the 30 mm -hmm. years he had spent in prison uh, uh, as an innocent man. And the moral of the story, I think, is that even a Supreme Court justice can be wrong when trying to divine what cases are, in fact, the worst of the worst. And that's my story of Henry Lee McCollum. Good. Steve, I think you're next. Okay, I'll just, I was waiting for Christina to- Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'll go ahead. That's fine. Thanks, Mark. That's really compelling. And uh, I knew about the case, but uh, you really fleshed it out well. Uh, add my thanks to uh, the law school for putting on this symposium. It's timely. It seems terrific. Uh, I only wish uh, personally I could be there in person to, and that we could all be together in person to participate in it. It would be a lot richer. Um, I'm going to talk about a case from Virginia that, like uh, the case Mark talked about, uh, raises serious questions about the phrase, the worst of the worst. Um, the uh, defendant is a man named Joe Geritano. And uh, Joe is arguably the most famous death row uh, inmate on Virginia's death row for a number of reasons, which I'll touch on. Joe, by the way, is a panelist in the four, in the four o'clock session this afternoon in this symposium, and he will be there in person. Um, the crime that Joe was convicted of was certainly horrific, uh, just like in the McCollum case uh, 43 years ago. Norfolk police discovered the bodies of Barbara Klein and her teenage daughter, Michelle, uh, in their apartment in the Ocean View neighborhood of Norfolk. Uh, Michelle had been raped and strangled to death. Barbara had been stabbed to death. Uh, certainly a horrific crime. Um, the police pretty quickly focused on Joe for a number of reasons. Uh, he had been living with Barbara and Michelle. He had been in their apartment uh, while he worked on a scallop boat. He was a scallop fisherman. Joe at the time was uneducated, drug addicted. Um, he was a ninth grade dropout and he was about, he was either 20 or 21 years old. Uh, no one knows for sure the year Joe was born. Um, but anyway, uh, he was for some, re for many reasons, a logical suspect, but what really focused them on Joe was, he confessed to the crime. And he not only confessed once, he confessed multiple times over a period of several weeks. And um, so the worst of the worst, terrible crime. Guys confessed to it multiple times. Pretty sure we got the right guy. Well, certainly the, the, uh, the legal process uh, operated in that fashion. Uh, Joe was convicted in a trial that lasted less than a day three months from the time the bodies were discovered. He was sentenced to death just a couple of months later in August, and he was sent to death row uh, where he was eventually gonna be executed, of course, uh, as the worst of the worst. Um, but the next 12 years uh, during which Joe spent on, all of which Joe spent on death row revealed him to be quite a different person from the person that was convicted and sentenced to death. Uh, during the first uh, three years he was there, Joe was convinced in his own mind uh, that he had committed this crime, even though he had no memory of it. Uh, he wanted to die. He, he, he tried to drop his appeal. He couldn't do that because it's an automatic appeal under Virginia law. Uh, he was on, uh, uh, I guess, uh, antipsychotic drugs uh, to help him with his mental issues. They, they were being administered by the authorities. Uh, he even decided to wean himself from those drugs so that he would be eligible to be executed. He clearly wanted to die. And then about three years in, he meets Marie Deans, who had been sent to Virginia to lead the Virginia Coalition on Jails and Prisons. And one of the tasks that Marie undertook was to find counsel for inmates on Virginia's death row that wanted to challenge uh, their, uh, to pursue post-conviction post relief from their convictions. Marie, uh, as she got to know Joe, uh, pretty quickly figured that he, he was not the person that she had been led to believe he was. He was sensitive, quiet, but passive. Uh, but as he got off the drugs, she discovered that he was much more complex than that. He was bright, curious, 
compassionate and engaging. Not only that, he had no memory of the crime. And the more Marie talked to him about the crime, the more she became convinced there was a good chance he wasn't guilty. Um, to sort of fast forward, eventually Marie uh, helped get counsel for Joe. Uh, Joe got counsel uh, who thoroughly investigated his case uh, and, and, and filed a petition for a pardon with Virginia's governor. Uh, in the meantime, Joe started to act the way he has continually act since he came out of the fog that he was in for all those years helping not only himself working on his own case, but working on others among the cases he helped was that of Earl Washington, who is so far the only exonerated, fully exonerated prisoner from Virginia's death row. And Joe was really highly instrumental in finding counsel for Earl, uh, who eventually were able to fully exonerate him. He got a full pardon. Um, in February of 1991, Governor uh, Wilder, then Governor Wilder issued a uh, conditional pardon for Joe, uh, which uh, uh, spared him from execution. I mean, Jerry, Jerry Zirkin knows a lot more about this than I because he was representing Joe at the time, but uh, while he was on death row, but uh, I wasn't at that time. But he, he J Joe accepted it. I mean, he basically had a gun in his temple and he, and he accepted it, uh, but uh, the, the order was a very unusual order. First of all, it said that Joe would be eligible for, for parole after he had served a full 25 years and said, and secondly, the order asked Virginia's attorney general to figure out a way to give Joe a new trial so that he could ex uh, establish his innocence. Well, that never happened. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, there was no DNA really available at this time. This was 1991. Once DNA became available, those of us, I was representing Joe at that time by then, uh, we tried to uh, have his, the biological evidence from his case tested, but surprise, surprise, Virginia had either lost or thrown away all the evidence from his case. So we were never able to establish his innocence in that fashion. Uh, in the meantime, Joe continued to do good things while he was prison. He got off of death row when he was at Augusta Correctional Center in Augusta County. Among the many things he did there, was he established, with the help of Coleman McCarthy, a well-known writer and columnist for the Washington Post, he established an alternatives to violence program that was administered, that, was, that, that, that the inmates participated in. And as a direct result of that program, the incidences of violence among the prisoners at Augusta dropped dramatically during the years that the course was taught. Joe did lots of other good things. Uh, I'll, I'll skip over that. Uh, he became eligible for parole in 2004. Uh, I and others represented him before the parole board for a number of years. We were eventually able to get him out. He was paroled uh, in December of 2017. Uh, he's been out ever since. He's out very successfully. Uh, he is married. Um, he owns a home. He works as a paralegal. He pays taxes. He votes, he's been released from parole. He became eligible to vote. Uh, as you will see this afternoon, when you see Joe on the panel, he is a, an amazingly remarkable individual and hardly the worst of the worst. Thank you, Steve. I think we now turn to John. Thank you. Um, my computer crashed now, <laughs> so I'm in the, the, the 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 courtroom can y'all hear all right yes okay so let me start by saying it's just great to be here with good friends steve and mark and jerry and hopefully i'll get to be good friends with christina one of these days um so uh, here's my story um the, the the topic uh it was worst of the worst uh so that's a phrase as we all know that prosecutors have used routinely to uh in death penalty cases to demonize the accused or desensitize jurors to the fact that the accused is a, is a human being. And, but as has been described and is now documented over and over and over, and all you have to do is take a look at the Innocence Project homepage or the um, uh, Michigan's uh, registry of um, exonerations uh, to, to know that um, this is a, a, a huge uh, 
problem. Uh, in my view, and I think in the view of some of the panelists, this phrase worst of the worst uh, rightly or may rightly refer to the manner in which the prosecution handles or mishandles uh, death penalty cases. Uh, it's not so hard to understand why that happens so often when the crime is allegedly horrific, the public pressure is extreme, and the pressure to win on the prosecution is multiplied, and that often results in um, an ends justifies the means kind of mentality, the ends being a run around um, the Constitution. So this panel was to focus um, in the main on innocence. Um, and as I said, we're all aware of the, the many who have been set for execution only to be exonerated sometimes at, at the last minute, like Earl Washington. Uh, I want to expand the notion of what's meant by innocence to include maybe guilty of the act, but not worthy of death, all right? And in fact, in most death cases, there's little issue about guilt of the crime and most death cases concern only whether or not the defendant is gonna live or die. Um, and here's where the same zeal to convict can also lead to a corrupt zeal to kill. The case I'm gonna focus on is that of Wilbert Evans, um, who I represented some years ago uh, on habeas. Um, it's a case which has marked my life uh, ever, ever since I uh, was involved in it. Evans was convicted of killing a deputy sheriff, William Truesdale, who I knew, uh, when Evans was escaping from the Alexandria City Jail. He got charged with capital murder. Uh, he had poor representation at trial. The trial lasted like two or three days, as best I can recall, which included impaneling a jury finding him guilty, having the, the penalty phase, and having death imposed. His lawyers presented no mitigating evidence whatsoever. That's a whole different story. Uh, notably, his sentence of death was based on the prosecution's knowing use of false evidence. The prosecution exaggerated Evans' prior criminal record. They used records to show that he had convictions, which he didn't have. One of those was for assaulting a police officer with a deadly weapon. And you can see how that could have been very influential for this jury because he was charged with doing the same thing in the current case. There was no such prior conviction. The prosecution knew it. They hid it from the defense. And the jury imposed a sentence of death on Evans, uh, finding that he posed a risk of future dangerousness, which is a basis for the death penalty in Virginia. I found out about all this several weeks before Evans was set to die in the electric chair, brought a habeas claim, the state conceded error, and they retried Evans. They gave him a second sentencing proceeding. He got the same result. He was sentenced to death. Um, and here's where the issue of death worthiness comes in. Well, we were appealing Evans' case. Uh, there was um, a massive escape from death row, Virginia's death row at Mecklenburg Penitentiary. Six inmates took guards hostage, uh, and while they were doing it, no one outside of the, the death uh, cell block knew about this. More guards would come, and they would be taken hostage. A nurse was taken hostage. The inmates were threatening to kill the guards. The nurse was tied to a bed and was uh, set to be raped. Evans, my client, who was right there in the middle of this, Evans told us that he acted to stop the rape of the nurse, Nurse Barksdale. Um, the inmates threatened to kill the hostages. Evans claimed to us that he stopped the inmates from killing the hostages. And then, remarkably, the inmates pretending to be the guards, called the main gate, said that they had found a bomb, asked the people at the gate to open the gate and bring in a truck, 
And then dressed as guards, they carried out what they claimed was a bomb. It was a TV set on a stretcher under a blanket, got in the truck and drove off, resulting in the largest manhunt uh, in Virginia's history. Evans, my client, did not go. He stayed. Um, the state claimed for years after that, that Evans was lying about his role during the escape. They claimed that he was part of it. And the only reason he didn't go was that at the last minute, he decided it was just too risky. It was a suicide mission. And so he'd rather stay. Um, and the thing is, all the while the state was making that claim, and all the while we were pursuing appeals and putting together a clemency petition for Evans, the state uh, continued to claim that he um, was part of this escape group. Um, they knew that that was not true because the state police had conducted a full investigation, interviewed all the guards who at that point had not had refused to talk to us and had learned that Evans saved their lives. As a matter of fact, the quotes from the guards were, if it wasn't for Evans, we would all be dead, all right? We got the state police report on the eve of Evans' execution. And we didn't get it from the state. We got it because a civil lawyer who was involved in litigation against the state of Virginia had serendipitously been given that police report realized what it was and gave it to us. This is the night before Evans was to be executed. Um, in any event, uh, the, um, we managed to get an affidavit or a letter from the, the ex-warden of the Mecklenburg Penitentiary, the guy who had been there at the time of this escape, saying that if you don't, this is while we were seeking clemency for Evans from the governor. And the warden said, if you don't reward Evans for what he did in helping the guards, all you're doing is sending a terrible message to everyone else in prison that it doesn't pay to follow the rules, um, which is a bad precedent, precedent and will make our job as correctional officers all that much more difficult. Um, all this evidence of Evans' unworthiness for the death penalty was ignored. Um, remember, Evans had been given a sentence of death based on the jury's prediction that he would be a future danger. And of course, his actions at Mecklenburg just proved the, the opposite, um, that he wasn't death worthy. When this was all brought to the attention of the Fourth Circuit, the Court of Appeals, shortly before Evans was ultimately executed, um, the court said, you know, it's too late. He had his trial, um, and we can't be relitigating whether or not he's a, a future danger, all right? That'll just open the floodgates uh, for every inmate to claim that they have changed. Evans' proof that he had changed was dramatic. Um, in any event, uh, this is what Thurgood Marshall had to say about that in his dissent from our last uh, petition for cert on the evening that Evans was ultimately executed. I'm just gonna read you a, a sentence or two from his dissent. The indifferent shrug of the shoulders with which the court answers the failure of its procedures in this case reveals the utter bankruptcy of the court's notion that a system of capital punishment can coexist with the Eighth Amendment. A death sentence that is dead wrong is no less so simply because its deficiency is not uncovered until the 11th hour. A system of capital punishment that would permit Wilbert Evans' execution, notwithstanding as to now unrefuted evidence showing that death is an improper system, is a system that cannot stand. That's my story, thank you. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Jerry. Well, thanks for uh, saying not least. 
Uh, Christina, it's great to see you. It's been many years, and it's good to see all my friends, even if by Zoom. Uh, and thanks to WNL. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, U.S. versus Daryl Rice, uh, which is uh, at least an hour-long story with a great PowerPoint normally, reduced to 10 minutes and just me. Uh, and I will let you decide at the end whether um, uh, who's the worst of the worst, uh, Daryl or the prosecutors. Um, Memorial Day weekend, 1996, a female couple was murdered at an isolated campsite in the Shenandoah National Park. They were bound, their throats were slit, they were not sexually assaulted. Uh, 70 agents, uh, federal agents worked the case for a year, uh, but uh, there was no arrest. Uh, one year later, uh, Darrell Rice uh, was in the Shenandoah National Park, uh, which he visited um, uh, with some frequency, uh, and he was arrested for harassing a female biker on the parkway, uh, a bizarre episode which uh, manifested his uh, mental illness. Uh, while being transported um, after his arrest, uh, Daryl uh, said, uh, did you ever solve those murders from last year? Uh, and of course, bells went off uh, and Rice now became the target. Uh, he uh, pled guilty to attempted abduction, got 15 years, in this just ridiculous episode, uh, presumably because the judge knew that he was the primary suspect in the double homicide. Uh, the FBI actually, while he's serving his time uh, 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 for the attempted abduction, the FBI actually put an agent in prison with him uh, for quite a period of time, uh, befriended Daryl to try to get a confession. Uh, when he got when the when the agent got out, uh, he uh, uh, claimed Daryl had confessed. He had a tape. Uh, when they played it, the tape was blank. Um, he uh, uh, Rice was indicted in two thousand two, uh, so not long after nine eleven. Um, and uh, Attorney General Ashcroft held a, a press conference, and I'm going to read you some of the things he said. Uh, these families have suffered what Americans uh, now know well, all too well. That's the pain and destruction wrought by hate, just as the United States will pursue, prosecute, and punish terrorists who attack America out of hatred for what we believe. We will pursue, prosecute, and punish those who attack law-abiding Americans out of a hatred for who they are. Hatred is the enemy of justice, regardless of its source. So he compares Daryl basically to 9-11 terrorists. Uh, definitely the worst of the worst. Uh, he's charged with, uh, Ashcroft said, he's charged with four counts of capital murder, two of which alleged that he intentionally selected his victims because of his hatred of women and homosexuals, Ashcroft being the big champion of women and homosexuals. Um, the uh, volatile, poisonous mixture of hatred and violence will not go unchallenged in the American system of justice. Um, and uh, we were off to the races. Uh, so here's the evidence of uh, hatred of women and homosexuals. Um, they held Daryl in a, in a, uh, in a cell uh, for his other case in the Charlottesville Federal Courthouse. Uh, they taped a snitch who was with him. The snitch tries to goad him about women. Don't you just hate him? They do all these terrible things. He goes on and on and on. Uh, and finally, Daryl in a calm voice says, have you ever tried yoga? Uh, the uh, government produces a transcript of uh, the conversation, and in the transcript, it begins with the uh, all too common unintelligible in brackets, uh, gays, they really make me mad. Um, that unintelligible, of course, uh, piqued our curiosity, so we took it to the guy who worked for sound for uh, uh, Dave Matthews in Charlottesville, and he enhanced it, and what it turned out to actually say say was, they said I hate gays, that really made me mad. Uh, the government response to our motion in limine uh, to keep that out was that the FBI had enhanced the tape, but the defense had, quote, super enhanced it. Uh, so much for the hate crimes. Uh, the uh, evidence uh, against Daryl, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of it, um, uh, none of it meaningful, but I'll go through some of it because uh, it's kind of humorous, actually. There's a phone call from the Shenandoah National Park payphone to a gay and lesbian hotline in San Rafael, California. 
Uh, it's a direct line of the director of the hotline. Uh, the government went to speak to the director and she told them, and she later told us, that um, that uh, the, uh, well, the government's position was that The director told them that um, uh, that, it, uh, that her that the phone number was not on the card. I never gave my direct line to anyone except to my partner. So we filed a motion in limine. We filed a motion in limine, and uh, the judge said to the prosecutor, "Do you have evidence that the victim had the phone number?" And the AUSA said. No, but we have evidence she would have wanted to have it. Uh, the judge was not impressed and that was kept out. The uh, number in fact is a combination of Rice's supervisor's number at work and the Grateful Dead ticket line in San Rafael, California. Um, the uh, government said that uh, there were, this is where the PowerPoint is really helpful. The government said that uh, they didn't have any evidence that Daryl was a Grateful Dead uh, fan, but they had recovered 600 bootleg dead tapes in his van uh, when it was seized, uh, when they seized it. Uh, Daryl is a pothead, of course, uh, which explains the uh, phone misdial. Uh, the Maryland uh, area code is 410, San Rafael is 415, and it went on from there. Um, uh, there's an eyewitness ID, and the eyewitness said that he saw, uh, identified Daryl in the woods from uh, 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 100 yards away. Uh, he was 65% sure uh, while Daryl was urinating for four minutes. And we were actually going to, had contacted a urologist to come and testify for us. Um, we could go on, but, uh, you know, it's enough fun. Uh, government conduct. So the grand jury, they put the uh, agent on to testify that there's no forensic value of uh, there's no forensic evidence of any value. Uh, in fact, it was DNA on the ligatures that were inconsistent with Daryl and with the victims. Uh, they said they gave us uh, 20,000 pages, uh, 10,000 pages, excuse me, of discovery. And they said, there's a storage shed with, with more there. Uh, you can have access to it if you want, but we gave you everything that's important. Uh, our uh, intrepid investigator, uh, Deirdre Enright, who now runs the uh, UVA Innocence Project, uh, was not to be denied. She spent a good part of a summer in an aluminum shed in Charlottesville going through everything that was there. Um, and of course, all the important stuff was there. Uh, we, we discovered that they had changed their timeline to match Daryl's presence in the park, uh, which when you go into the park, your, uh, uh, a photograph is taken of your license plate. Uh, so they knew when he was there. So they changed the timeline. So we got the original one. Uh, uh, and um, uh, there were interviews with exculpatory witnesses. So there were two volunteers who, um, long-term volunteers who said that they had seen the victims after the time frame when the government uh, had, to, had to have the murders for it to be Rice. Uh, they were subsequently barred from working in the park. Uh, there was a waitress at the restaurant who testified that the victims had come in. It was raining all that uh, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, she testified that the victims had come in and had breakfast. Um, she uh, found the ticket uh, for their meal. Uh, it was the most precise uh, ID I'd ever seen. She said that one of, the, one of the women had calcium deposits on her teeth. She knew the dog's name, Taj. She knew that one of them came from Vermont and went to the university there, more than that. Uh, but it didn't work for the government. So the agent went back to interview her again she repeated the story. The agent told her she was wrong uh, because, in fact, the women had been killed uh, before the date on that ticket. Um, uh, a motions hearing uh, on that evidence, uh, the government actually said, and I swear this is true, the government actually said that that couldn't have been them, them because they got bacon and sausage and they were such avid vegetarians that they wouldn't even have gotten bacon and sausage for their dog. Uh, just before we were about to go to trial, uh, there was some final forensics. Uh, a hair was discovered in a glove, which they'd had now for like uh, seven years, um, which had never been tested. Uh, they tested it for mitochondrial DNA. It excluded Daryl. 
the government then dismissed the case without prejudice over our objection. Um, the judge granted it while saying, we all know that this case isn't coming back. Uh, Daryl, I will say, was then suffered uh, what, what in, the, in the era of, of uh, in the internet, uh, you're never innocent. So he was run out of various towns because people would discover what he'd been charged with um, uh, and really had a very difficult time after that. Uh, an unhappy ending, unlike uh, Joe Gerritano's. Uh, a postscript, they had made uh, Daryl into the Route 29 stalker uh, as part of their case, if anybody remembers that case. Uh, somebody who'd harassed women on Route 29, but also had killed a woman named Alicia Showalter Reynolds. Uh, Deirdre totally took that uh, part of the case apart. Um, and we are confident that we have in fact now identified the actual killer in the case, a guy named Mark Ivonix, uh, who was a serial killer known to have killed three women uh, young women near Fredericksburg. He was killed by the police in a shootout in South Carolina. Both the feds and the state of Virginia now refuse to do DNA testing against Ivanitz in order to, in fact, prove whether our theory is true or false. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks to all of you. These have really been extraordinary cases. So I guess my first question for all four of you is about the phrase, the worst of the worst. You have each described crimes, which I think you have all agreed and acknowledged are terrible. Uh, but you have each then focused your um, critique of whether it's the worst of the worst, not on the crime, uh, but on the people that you represented. Why is that where the focus should be, right? Why should the focus not be on the question of whether the crime was in fact horrific, right? Much of the public says, you know, I've never seen a crime this terrible. This crime deserves the death penalty. Why is that focus incorrect? Why is that, you know, assessment incorrect? And I'll throw it out to any one of you. Mark, you're on mute. So um, it's, it, I, I think the focus is not really, it's not, it's, it's not really on our clients. It's really on our complete inability to ascertain who the worst of the worst are. I mean, that, that's, I think that's the moral of, of, of the stories that we already hear. Government misconduct, I thought John Shapiro made a really important point that this goes beyond innocence. Uh, 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 and Steve's story uh, about Joe that we're going to we're going to hear from later uh, that he's clearly not the worst of the worst no matter how you analyze the case we have a complete inability to assess who's the I mean there are many problems with the death penalty the one we're addressing in this panel is our our ability or our desire to divine who's the worst of the worst and clearly we do not have that ability I, I think that's really where the focus is. You know what, what, what? Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I just wanted to add. Um, I, I think, Christina, to to respond directly to your question, I think the reason that, certainly speaking for myself, and I think for the others as well, that we talked about our clients in the context of the worst for the wor worst of the worst is because advocates for the death penalty use that phrase when talking about those who quote deserve to die, who, whose lives have no redeeming social value and they don't deserve to continue living. But you're right, it can also be used to describe the crime. And I've often thought of it in both ways. But I think that case after case after case after case has demonstrated that the system is not, if you're just talking about the person, the defendant, the system is not capable of identifying people who quote, deserve to die. And even if you're a person I mean, I don't believe anybody deserves to die at the hands of the state. That, that's my view. And I think, I, I mean, all of us probably feel that way. But even if you believe, even if you're a supporter of the death penalty, you have to acknowledge that the system does a terrible job of identifying those people. I, I, um, let me just say a couple of things, too. I, I agree with everything that's been said, but what does it even mean to be the worst of the worst? And how does yeah. that bear any kind of relationship to killing somebody? Um, you know, uh, sure, there are people who are bad, but we all know on this panel and most everybody who's 
watching this, that there are reasons people do what they do. Um, you know, I've told juries, I'm sure everybody here has, that everybody starts out as an, an innocent little baby and, and things happen. Um, d does that give us as a society the right to say, okay, you've crossed the line, we're getting rid of you. Um, and I'm always reminded of this uh, quote from one of my favorite movies, The Shawshank Redemption, where you know Mor Morgan Freeman's up for parole after being in prison for God knows how long, and they ask him, you know, have you have you rehabilitated yourself? And he says, you know, I don't even know what that means. He says, I I reach out to that 18 year old kid who I used to be, and I want to tell him, you know, don't do that, don't pull the trigger or whatever it was he did. But he's gone. I can't talk to him anymore. He's disappeared. And I think, you know, if if you're giving up on the hope that people will change, then uh, that's a, it's a sad thing uh, to to say. Gary. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, I think from the standpoint of the crimes, one of our capital colleagues from, from New Jersey, Dave Runke, always says every crime that comes, comes along is worse than every other crime that you've seen. And, you, you know, so he, he you know, you get um, you get 9-11, uh, uh, you've got people jumping off buildings. Is that the worst of the worst? Well, Masawi had so little to do with that, you know, but it's like, oh, there are people jumping off buildings. It's terrible. We're going to give him death, even though he's really didn't do anything to contribute to it. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you're talking about what the crimes are, they are all individually terrible in one way or the other, either because of who the victim was. Uh, you know, what? look what the Virginia General, General Assembly almost did, right? So we, we abolish, and what do they come back with? A bill to do one thing, to give the death penalty to the killers of law enforcement officers like somehow by definition that class of murders is worse than every other murder it's all worse than the child rape murders it's worse than everything else because it's law enforcement officer um so you know it, so that's how they were going to define the worst of the worst was going to be killing a police officer thank you so I'm going to change uh, the focus a little bit. You have all noted that we're talking about innocence here, and I would love to hear your views on sort of uh, first the challenge of let's start with the challenge of proving innocence, which, of course, is um, an upside down right is an upside down statement because we all come into the system with uh, bearing the presumption of innocence. But I know every single one of you understands that once you are in the system, the burden of proving innocence right lies truthfully right on the defense um and so i would love to hear your uh view of the role of the defense in sort of upholding uh, that presumption of innocence or requiring uh the state to meet their burden of you know overcoming the presumption of innocence and specifically i'm going to i guess flag uh my colleagues who've got expertise in virginia well actually both in virginia and philadelphia i think have really specific experiences with the impact of you know uh, the defense bar on not just proving innocence, but just generally you know advocacy overall in death penalty cases. But we'll focus it for this conversation on innocence. And so, uh, who would like to start? My answer is really simple. Yeah, you hire Deidre Enright to be your investigator, <laughs> <laughs> and then you just and then you just wait. Okay, but for those that might not have Deirdre, <laughs> sort of more systemically, shall we say? Well, you don't take you don't take anything at face value. You know, you don't you don't get the you don't get the tape and say uh, it, that it actually says what the prosecutor has. In yeah. the of what it says. You know, you go behind it. You do try to get it enhanced. You listen to it more carefully. You mm -hmm. try to pick it up hard. You never. You just don't accept what they say at face value about anything, that the witnesses actually said what they claim they said or that they will say it again. Yeah. So Christina, you're, you're, I, you're, I think you're familiar with the Kareem Johnson case in Philadelphia. Maybe, you're, maybe every, other people are not. This is a case where a man went to death row because there was the victim's blood on his hat. Uh, at the crime scene, and a police officer actually testified that there were fresh drops of blood on that hat. The defense attorneys, in, as Jerry points out, took the word of the prosecutor, didn't do really any investigation at all. Turned out 
that there was no blood on the hat and that the police officer had committed perjury, they were talking, and that there was another hat that the victim was wearing that had his blood on it. So, you, you know, when the defense bar is that, I mean, I, the only word that comes to my mind is pathetic, um, then of course, you know, that's the start of injustice everywhere. Uh, I think Helen talked about the, the, the death penalty ended in Virginia when they decided to bring in regional expert counsel. Um, and from that moment on, the death penalty was doomed because the state had actually funded uh, a competent counsel to handle these cases. And that's, that's the real story. And that's, of course, the same as the experiment in Philadelphia, right? You had the homicide unit that you were a part of that was fully funded, um, and there were no uh, death sentences from there. Uh, any other comments? I just wanted to add uh, a, an additional factor in all of this, and it was really highlighted in the Daryl Rice case. You're dealing in a number of these cases with prosecutors and police who cheat, and they are so anxious to get another scalp on their belt that they'll do anything including cheat to kill the defendant and that is just it's awful i mean um and i don't know what we can do about that i mean that's one of the issues i think with the so-called adversarial system um but uh it's in death cases it's 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 a it's it's a serious problem to so say the least I want, to, I want to disagree with Steve a little bit, only to this extent. I think that there are a lot of forces that uh, ca cause uh, prosecutors to cheat. Uh, it's not necessarily that they want another scalp. And, and with the feds, of course, they're, they're, they're not elected, unlike the Commonwealth attorneys. It's not right. like talking about getting elected. Um, there could be a million things. So they stake out a position, uh, like Ashcroft did in our case. They stake out a position that this is what happened. Um, and, and, you know, come hell or high water, they don't want to turn around right. and say we were wrong. And w one of the things that happened in our case, everybody knows that, that Ashcroft in, in Rice, one of the things, you know, Ashcroft got ill at one point and Jim Comey became the acting attorney general. Uh, right. And what happened in Rice's case was that, uh, Comey, Comey was the acting attorney general when the, the attorney general in the federal system has to agree to withdraw the death notice before you can get a case dismissed. And so we had to get approval of the attorney general. And so I was able now to not write to Ashcroft, but to write to Comey, uh, you know, whom I knew from his days in Richmond in the Eastern District. Uh, and, uh, you know, he took a look at it and he threw it out. But if I'd been going to Ashcroft, the guy who had originally said all this stuff, who knows what he would have done. Yeah. But, so, so there are all kinds of different forces at play. It can be the family, it can be the police, uh, you know, it can be running for re-election, um, but, uh, but there are a lot of things w that cause them to not, uh, you know, to proceed with trying to get death in a case. Yeah. Can, I, can I throw in a comment uh, before we leave this, uh, Christina? Uh, you know, I, we're focused rightfully on death penalty cases, but I mean, this goes beyond that. It goes to the entire system. And as I, I mentioned, if you take a look at the, you know, uh, registry of exonerations, which is a terrific website that uh, people ought to check out, run by the University of uh, Michigan <laughs> Law School. I, I don't know what they're up to now. Twenty one hundred exonerations. These are people who are unquestionably innocent um, since. I don't know when it is, the early 80s or something when they started keeping track of this. That's an a, a incredible condemnation of the criminal justice system. And I just end my comment with this. I tell this to my students. You know, we have a great system of justice in this country, you know, great on paper, but it, it's all run by people. Yeah. <laughs> and people are deeply flawed. And whether they're judges, prosecutors, or defense attorneys, I mean, there's fault on every side. And so, you, there is injustice under every rock. Thank you. And yes, it's about 3,000 since 1989 is, mm -hmm. I think, the stat uh, of, uh, wrongfully convicted, exonerated people in the country. So you all have uh, guessed my next topic, which was about prosecutors and how prosecutors can and should be approaching this differently. A, to make sure that 
they are actually executing and fully, you know, investing their resources into making sure that no innocent person is wrongfully convicted of a crime and sentenced to death, but just generally, right, not wrongfully pursuing the death penalty. There are lots of examples of prosecutors doing different things across the country, and I'm wondering uh, what you all have seen that you think, you know, are good examples of, of how prosecutors can and should be doing this the right way. Well, the, in, in Virginia, we had, uh, you know, under our previous attorney general, they were um, taking some steps, I think, to, to do that. Uh, it's turned around uh, completely. And we had the episode reported yesterday where uh, the new attorney general actually withdrew his, uh, uh, the office's agreement to a petition of actual innocence, said they were going to argue against it. Um, so we're going ob obviously in a very different direction for the next four years. Um, so, so we, we had a good, we had something at least that was a start in right. that direction, um, and, uh, it has come to a grinding halt. Didn't we have Jerry, uh, also within the office of the attorney general, a conviction integrity, yes, uh, group we did. That, that now disbanded has been disbanded by right. the current attorney general. Yeah. He's a fascist period. Yeah, he is. <laughs> I love being on this panel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so I, I, I mean, Christina, you, you know, it's really a good question. I've said for years that being a good prosecutor is infinitely harder than being a good defense attorney. Good defense attorney, you're zealous. You do everything you can do within the bounds of the law to get the best result for your client. It's this very simple role. Uh, it, it may be hard to accomplish, but it's simple to define. A good prosecutor has to do justice. It's, it's, you can't get caught up in the stuff we're talking about, the, the competition. I think what Steve mentioned about the adversary system. A good prosecutor can't get caught up in that. So you're talking about a culture. These guys are in Philadelphia. We've got a prosecutor now who wants to uncover mistakes, Larry Krasner, and I, I give him a lot of credit. Um, we've got to change the culture of offices. Um, we've got to have open file policies. Um, and and we've, got to, we've got to say, look, if a mistake was made, you know, the best thing to do is come right out. And, I mean, look at Joe Freeman Britt. It's incredibly obvious that Roscoe Artis committed that crime, but he goes to his dying breath saying it's Henry McCollum, but he can't admit a mistake. I think we can change the culture of offices if we elect real reform prosecutors who encourage honesty and not winning. And I, you know, I always encourage law students to become prosecutors because uh, we need yep. good prosecutors. It's true. It, it should be noted, I guess most everybody knows, and uh, Mark's referenced the, you know, reform prosecutor in Philadelphia, Krasner. Um, there are others in, you know, where, where we live in Northern Virginia, um, the, uh, and the Fairfax County elected a reform prosecutor uh, Arlington County did the same thing. Loudoun County did the same thing in this last go round. Now, unfortunately, they're, they're all receiving, including the Philly uh, DA, uh, massive uh, 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 resistance, I guess you could call it, from law enforcement. Uh, so, some law enforcement just don't even talk to the, the prosecutors any, anymore. And what that's going to do in the next you know, election round, I don't know. Um, it, it was great to see this little ember, uh, and I hope it can grow into a, a flame. Absolutely. OK, well, let's change the subject. Uh, in Helen's opening, she introduced and spoke a little bit about the role of race in the administration of the death penalty. Obviously, it's an issue that I argued in the Supreme Court. And I am curious um, how you all have seen race play a role in the death penalty and how, if at all, you think, you know, it influences a decision to seek or not to seek or a decision for a jury to impose or not to impose or just how at all, uh, how, if at all, you think race plays a role in the death penalty. <laughs> Go ahead, Jared. No, I'll no, play. no, you, Mark. I, I, it doesn't play a role. It plays the role. It, it, it's, it's, I mean, at least in my experience, it's virtually everything. 
in, in the death penalty. So, so for years we had uh, uh, Lynn Abraham as our prosecutor, a pretty well-known prosecutor across the country. Uh, after Joe Freeman Britt, she was described as the deadliest prosecutor. Not a, not a, not a man, uh, uh, not from the South, but a woman from Philadelphia described as the deadliest prosecutor. And and you know when people would accuse her of racism. She said, I'm not going to get accused of racism. I'm going to seek it in every case where there is a legitimate aggravating factor. Well, of course, there's an aggravating factor. Our statutes are so broad, there's an aggravating factor in almost every case. And so she's seeking it in almost every case. And in almost every case, a person of color is on trial. So it's, you know, it's a kind of a fraudulent look the other way. I'm really not a racist at all. I'm just seeking it in every case I can. Um, you know, I think that's kind of an absurd explanation. So, I, I mean, I don't have a, a, a you know, a specific explanation. I, I think a lot of academics think that race is an outgrowth of lynching. Um, and I do too. And, you know, there's plenty of proof of it if you, you know, yeah. compare maps and so forth. So I think it's everything. I don't think it's just, it's not a small factor. It's a very, very large factor. And of course, we, because we know in the history in Virginia is that we had relatively few lynchings compared to a lot of other places in the South uh, because the judicial system did it for us. Yeah. It is, you know, that, that uh, 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 connection has been well drawn. So we relied on a judicial system that could be, could, that would convict people automatically, uh, uh, black people and execute them, um, you know, end of story. And so we didn't have, so that we just substituted that for it. You know, Mark, your, your story is interesting because we had the exact same thing with a guy named Bill Fuller in uh, the city of Danville, much smaller jurisdiction, obviously, but he was killing people at a pretty uh, quick rate. And that was his defense also. His, yep. Everybody was black and his defense was, oh, well, I just seek it in every case because I raised it. He said, no, 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 They're, it's just, I do it in any case I possibly can. And Virginia also had this incredibly broad strategy. Oh, strategy. sure. So he was, he was able to do it. Yep. John, Steve, or keep going. Uh, all right. You know, all you gotta do is look at uh, McCleskey versus Kemp. I mean, the, the proof was right there. And there was a you know horrible opinion from the US Supreme Court, I think authored by uh, an alum of this law school. Uh, and, um, you know, I mean, the, 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 the statistical evidence was just overwhelming, completely uh, clear. And, and the Supreme Court, you know, hid behind this notion that, well, you know, discretion is, you know, just a, a, um, a, a part of the criminal justice system that we cannot govern. It, it's, uh, it's there and, it, it, and um, it's not our job to limit the discretion of prosecutors or juries. We can't do that. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah. And in the category of too little, too late, Justice Powell said it was the decision he regretted the most. Uh, right. In his, yes. in his mind. Exactly right. All right. Let's talk a little bit about future dangerousness. Uh, it came up a few times as part of the Virginia, it was part of the Virginia uh, death penalty statute. And it's, you know, a thing that is in the news, certainly in New York, we have a new brand new mayor who is uh, seeking to introduce a future dangerousness assessment into bail decisions. Um, and there's lots of talk about being able to use algorithms to, you know, and predictive technology to figure out who is and who is not dangerous in the country. Uh, but the good news is that we do have um, a history of experience in the country on how predictions of future dangerousness that are done through the criminal legal system uh, work out because this has been going on in the death penalty system uh, for so many years. So I would right. love to hear all of you sort of weigh in on this question of uh, predictions of future dangerousness in, you know, from your experience in the death penalty. Uh, can I just say one thing and then I'll pass it along. The only thing we're worse at then divining who actually is the worst of the worst is divining who is a future danger. That's the, that's the one proven fact that we've always gotten wrong. And, and anybody that does federal work certainly knows that. Right. So I, that's all I have to say about it. So yeah. it, it's, a fool's, it's a fool's errand. Christina, Christina I had, so I had a case uh, uh, called USB Beckford, which was a 
a crack cocaine gang, 1990, it was tried in 1996. Um, uh, five defendants um, were tried uh, capitally um, and with a bunch of homicides, uh, all of, all of, um, uh, of sort of other people in the drug trade. Uh, but in any event, um, uh, so they all, so, the, so, so there are, excuse me, there are, four, there are four that are tried capitally. They all go to trial together. Um, we had um, uh, Mark Cunningham, who uh, was a master at this, testify on future dangerousness um, and using predictive models. Um, and um, he, uh, uh, the government expert was going to testify that they were all gonna be uh, dangerous and would kill again. Uh, fortunately, he wasn't allowed to take the stand. Um, so they don't, so, uh, not, nobody gets death. Uh, when the case is over, the uh, judge writes a letter to Janet Reno, which he copied all, to all defense counsel saying, because uh, he had found that they'd all been sent to a regular uh, USP, a, a penitentiary. And he writes a letter saying, uh, basically telling Reno, she and her staff are unbelievable idiots. Uh, these defendants asked to go to Supermax um, what are you doing? These are the most dangerous people I've ever seen. Um, uh, and um, I wrote back to Reno and sort of explained things. We hadn't asked to go to Supermax. We just said that it was an option. Uh, the end result is, uh, so that's 1996. They've been in prison ever since. Um, and um, all four of them have moved down to medium security prisons. Mm -hmm. uh, and as of, Mark was, was tracking them for a while for me. Uh, as of several years ago, between them, they didn't have a single rules violation yeah. at, in like 20 years. Uh, so he was gonna testify that they were gonna, going to kill again. Um, and, you know, it was just, uh, 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 it's been proven in their case with all four of them that it was utter nonsense. Right. Yeah. Cun Cunningham, is, is the, he is the leading uh, uh, expert on the ability to predict future dangerousness. He, he did this great study, by the way, which I'm sure everybody here is familiar with, um, concerning the Furman commutees, the people who were um, sentences were reduced to life after they got death sentences, but then Furman was decided and their death sentences were set aside. And what happened to them after that? And, you know, the incidence of violence in prison was, you know, diminishing, close to zero. Um, I think the American Psychiatric Association told the Supreme Court, in whatever case it was that went up there, about this issue, maybe one of several, that uh, experts, psychiatrists are, are as not even as good as dogs in predicting future dangerousness. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a quote. Well, I think we're just at about time. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, I, and I think you know, good good as dogs at predicting future dangerousness is. <laughs> they can imagine no better. Oh no, we have. I'm sorry. We do have. Five, we have ten more minutes. It looks like I just got a note. <laughs> Oh. So let me keep, we got a few more minutes to keep talking. All right, so don't, don't, yes, yeah, so keep your brains working right now. All right, so let's talk, several of your cases involved issues of intellectual disability and issues of mental illness. And I'm curious, particularly, since I know we're supposed to focus on innocence, how those things factor in or contribute to or increase the likelihood of a person being wrongfully convicted and sentenced to death, in your experience. Well, Maybe Jerry, could, could you yeah. talk about Earl Washington? Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, so I'll do that. So, so one of my clients was uh, in habeas was Earl Washington, although credit for the case truly goes to uh, Bob Hall from Fairfax, uh, a spectacular litigator uh, who really was the brains behind it. But, but Earl, so Earl confesses. Um, and um, uh, he gets everything wrong, essentially. Um, I mean, you name it, you know, the race of the victim, where it happened, uh, but they were able to manipulate him 
into the convention, uh, convention, take him around to different places uh, in the apartment complex and say, no, Earl wasn't at this one. Uh, and so they work the confession. Uh, they eventually get it. Uh, unfortunately, a terrible representation at trial and they really didn't attack the confession at all. So, so he gets, conv and he, he's convicted. I think the jury was out 15 minutes in Earl's case yeah. and, 10 min and 15, 10 minutes on penalty. Um, so, uh, so here's somebody who's been exonerated by DNA who got everything wrong in his conf confession, but <laughs> convicted and sentenced to death anyhow, uh, and got within, as we all know, got within nine days of execution. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so, so it can be the whole ball of wax. I mean, it's really they, they you know, people like that are often going to have a hard time. Uh, so Earl's, for instance, if you talk to Earl, uh, when, when they put Earl on the stand, Earl didn't testify, I didn't do it, the confession's wrong. Earl said, I didn't tell them that. Now, of course, he had told them that. So it's just, he just couldn't wrap his brain around yeah. what actually had happened. Uh, so representing people with intellectual di disabilities is, you know, incredibly hard. Mental illness, obviously, can do the yeah. same things. But in Daryl Rice's case, uh, you had uh, the problem was that every that he was the suspect because he was mentally ill, uh, and he and he produced evidence because he was mentally ill. He produced it for them by the things that he did, um, and and it was uh, and he was high functioning schizophrenic. Uh, he had a job and all that, but it was he wasn't easy to work with as a client. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's very difficult to do. I just wanted to add uh, on the Earl Washington case, there's an excellent book about that case by a writer named Margaret Eads, E-D-D-S. And the name of the book is An Expendable Man. And it is one of the best things I've ever seen written about uh, the legal process, the judicial process in a capital case. So in Philadelphia, two 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 guys uh, uh, were in prison for very long periods of time. Uh, Twenty years later, on a cold kind of fingerprint, my client got picked up, uh, confessed to five or six murders. Uh, they charged him with four of them, four or five of them. The sixth one were these two guys serving all this time, and uh, it turned out that both had confessed. Both were very low functioning. Both had confessed because of the fear of the death penalty, which has an incredible coercive uh, effect, as you might imagine. Um, and then one of them actually took a deal and testified against the other one. They were both completely innocent, and my client was guilty. And they both e eventually went free. But I, you know, the combination of intellectual disability and the coercive fear of getting a death sentence right. is what drove that case, and I think probably drives a lot of cases. Yeah, and you know, uh, Mark, that that leads into the other part that one one of the effects of the death penalty, which we don't talk about, is the people who don't get death, but who serve get these incredibly long sentences yep. because they do confess out of fear over the death penalty, um, and so they you know they take the first degree murder plea even though they didn't do it. They take a, a, an agree to a sentence that's unbelievably long because of the fact they're afraid of death. And that happens every day. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. All right. One other issue that also came up in many of your descriptions of your cases were, and we little touched on it a little bit here, about the, this issue of false confessions. And I would love to hear all of you speak of sort of the work of how you even uncover Right? How you determine that these confessions are false, especially in the context, as we've just talked about, of, of clients who are not able, you know, due to their disabilities, you know, to be particularly helpful, right, in the regard of establishing um, uh, that a confession may be false or uh, coerced. I, yeah. I, I will just mention briefly I, I litigated a, at trial a, a false confession case. The whole defense was built around our claim that the confession was false. We were fortunate in that the confession, the interrogation was 
videotaped and we were able to deconstruct it. I had expert help um, and uh, I got a, a, a huge education about false confessions by litigating that case. And I'll just say simply this, um, police departments around the country are trained about how to get confessions. I mean, this is a formal thing and it's very clever. Um, there's all kinds of psychological um, persuasion brought to bear. You don't, it doesn't have to be a, you know, in your face yelling interrogation. That's sort of old school, although I guess it still happens, but it's, it, it's very professional, it's very slick, and people who have um, you know, not done things will confess because they think that that is their way out of all this difficulty. It happens all the time. This is what led to the Miranda decision. The Supreme Court talked at length in Miranda about the, um, the training that police get, the psychological training. So um, it's insidious. So one big move in the country to help combat this is the move to record confessions so that you can actually show a jury what actually happened. Right. I think we have time for just one more comment. So I think, uh, Jerry, you're it. Uh, so I was I was just gonna I was just gonna say that so in the Wisconsin case and I don't remember the, the names of the defendants but in the Wisconsin case they with the juvenile they did record it uh, it's unbelievably manipulative how they get that kid to confess I mean just you're sitting there going I can't believe that that you know this is, but he had intellectual disability they get the confession and the Wisconsin Supreme Court ends up saying no problem here yeah. so. Uh, you know, you can record them. It even recorded, you know, the legal system is just un, often reluctant to take it seriously. Right. So it's good for them. Absolutely. Well, thank you all. This has been fun to see all of you again and have this conversation. I think we are uh, just at about uh, time for this conversation today. So thanks so much to Washington and Lee and to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.